I live in North London, so thank you everyone here for doing a nice reenactment of the Northern Line at uh, Newtown. It is. I, it, I'm always a little bit sceptical, you know, when you get an email, say, from your local party saying it's really important you RSVP so that we get the right size venue. This time, I think it was actually true. So I hope nobody faints uh, while I speak. Um, it is, obviously, it's an incentive for me to not, not quite do a William Baston length uh, speech this evening. You'll be glad to know. Um, but what I thought I would talk a little bit about is how to win. Because um, that's obviously a topic that's very much on the forefront of most of our minds at the moment. Um, it's also a topic that is just a lot more enjoyable to talk about now than it <laughs> was for quite a long time. Because, I mean, it's easy to just forget how radically and how quickly the party's prospects have improved in less than a year. If you think what we've seen happen this year, there was the local government elections, where across the country as a whole, we had our best results since basically history books began. Over 700 net gains uh, across across the country, far more than, for example, the Alliance achieved in its 1980 heydays, or the Liberal Democrats under, say, Charles Kennedy in the wake of the Iraq War. So you have to go back um, at least to 1945 and probably further back than that to find the last time we did so well in terms of gaining seats at council elections. So fantastic result, and then off the back of that, European Parliament elections. I suspect quite a few people in the party privately sort of sighed a little bit when they realised we would have European Parliament elections to fight because they're not always the type of election we do best in. And it was then a sudden huge extra burden on bank accounts and shoe leather and evening time and so on. But not only 16 MEPs elected, we outpolled the Tories across the country for the first time since 1910. We outpolled Labour, and in fact, for the first time ever, neither Labour nor the Conservatives were one of the top two parties in a national election. And as if that wasn't progress enough, we then won the Brecon and Radnishire by election, as well as picking up a, I won't attempt to get the number right because I'll probably get it wrong, but an increasing number of MPs who have decided to join us from, from other parties, which is a real sign of our success and our progress, that people who maybe six months or a year ago were thinking, well, I'm fed up with my own party, but I'm not quite sure about those Lib Dems, are now increasingly making the plunge to say, actually, yeah, no, the Lib Dems, they're the successful people, they're the ones fighting successfully for Remain, so they're the ones I'm going to join. Who knows what the outcome of the Labour Party conference will be, other than increasing confusion over their stance on Remain, but there is a fantastic opportunity here. Um, and it is also one that is, before every general election, people often talk about how it's the most important election there's ever going to be. And quite often it's not really true, in part because the issues at stake at general elections very often are ones that politicians can't directly control. So climate change is massively important, but we can't pass a law to order nature to reduce the temperatures next week. Crime, massively important. But as you know, we know all too well, passing laws doesn't in itself result automatically in crime falling. So there are lots of really important issues that normally come up at elections where definitely who gets elected makes a difference. But it's not a direct vote for that person or that party and it will definitely change. Brexit is really different in that respect in that it is massively important for the future of our country, our society, our economy, our public services and it is directly in the control of politicians. If there is a Liberal Democrat Prime Minister tomorrow, she can't just legislate to say, hey nature, turn down the thermostat tomorrow. She can immediately revoke Article 50. So this election will, I think, genuinely be one of those generations of shifting future-making contests. And the great thing is, for all the flaws in our democratic system, for all the problems with the electoral system and the loopholes over party funding and all of that, we still have a pretty well-functioning democracy. One only has to look at the pictures, say, on the evening news from somewhere like Hong Kong to realise, actually, we do still have a pretty good democracy. We have one in which the rule of law is still upheld and courts are still independent. But also, we have one where the individual efforts of all of us 
can make a difference to the result. It's not just that politics is something decided over up in London or by, you know, by forces far away. It's what we individuals collectively can do can make a real difference to the result. So how do we do that? Well, I think there are four key things to winning, which I'll talk about. One is about message. One is about having the right team. One is about the volume of activity. And then the fourth one is about the importance of targeting under first past the post. Gives us sort of a subsidiary, as it were, to the other three, but I think very important to bear in mind given the practicalities of a likely imminent general election. So on message, I think the thing that almost everybody active in politics tends to forget is just how little most of the public know about politics. Not because they're stupid or anything like that, but just because people decide to pay attention to other things. And so it's quite common to find somebody who, for example, knows very little about politics, but my goodness, you get them onto the sport that they're a fan of, and they've got huge amounts of information available, very nuanced, well-thought-out arguments about how the way the LBW rule was changed 12 years ago was completely wrong. So, yeah, huge amounts of knowledge and information, but they just decide not to deploy that on politics. But to give you one example of this... In May 2017, so after we knew that Theresa May was going to call the general election, YouGov carried out an opinion poll where one of the questions was to ask people who the leader of the Tory party was. And one in five people couldn't name Theresa May as the leader of the Tory party, even though these were people who were willing to do a YouGov poll about politics. So it's really easy for us to overestimate how much the public know about politics. And that's why... I always say, sort of slightly tongue-in-cheek, but not so seriously, being known as a single-issue party isn't a failure, it's a sign of success. Because if people actually know one thing about us, that's one thing more than they felt they've known about us for a very long time. And if you look at what... Um, well, there's a little bit of a myth, I guess, about what happened between us and the public during the coalition years. Definitely there was a little bit of a parting of the ways, uh, but... If you look at, for example, what the British Election Studies found, or indeed YouGov as well found, and other sort of forms of research found, is the consistent pattern is not so much that lots of people ended up hating us, but they just thought they didn't really know what we stood for. And they thought it was not so much, oh, I hate you, but I just don't, know, don't get what you're for, don't really see why you're relevant anymore. Um, so again, to give you an example from a YouGov poll about a year after the coalition ended, they asked people, do you think the Lib Dems were right or wrong to go into coalition? And then if people said wrong, have you forgiven them or not? And only one in five people both said we were wrong to go into coalition and they hadn't forgiven us. But it wasn't until this year that many of them were willing to start thinking about voting Lib Dem again because they just felt we were a bit irrelevant, didn't really know what we stood for, a bit confused after a coalition quite what, you know, where does this party stand? And that was the brilliant simplicity of our European election campaign, or more precisely, the slogan. Now, the slogan, bollocks to Brexit, when it was chosen, was a little bit controversial. You can understand reasons why people might be a little bit hesitant. In fact, given the number of us crammed into this room, there's probably, I guess if it's fairly typical cross-section of Lib Dem membership, probably two or three of you are probably even, I think, oh, you know, wince slightly at that slogan. In fact, it was, there was sufficient concern over how controversial it would be that the official version of the European Election Manifesto just had on its front cover... Um, stop Brexit. And then there was this special collector's edition. We had bought the <laughs> of course, what happened was everyone wanted to buy that one, and the official version almost nobody was. So there are still boxes of the official European election manifesto available. So if you have a need for 500 of them, I'm sure you can get them very cheap, but you could do you a great deal. Uh, but the brilliant simplicity of that message was it was about something that's relevant to people, that people feel is important Brexit. I'm very clear about where we stand, but with a bit of an emotional kick to it. And if you think about other slogans, sometimes from people whose politics we very much disagree with, they tend to be similar to that. Think about, say, Donald Trump and build that wall, or the Leave campaign at the last referendum and take back control. There's a sense of a bit of active clarity and passion around those slogans, which we have often lacked in the past, but bollocks of Brexit caught absolutely brilliantly. Um, so having that clarity of message in a way that people feel it says something about you know, what we're going to do on the most important issue, but also says that we're passionate and we do have a purpose. You know, there is a reason why we're around still as a party. 
massively important. And of course that applies just as much in council elections. It can be a little bit more challenging to come up with a similar clarity of message, but it's not a coincidence that if you look at, say, some of the councils where we gained huge numbers of seats and took control this May, you see a consistent pattern very often of them having latched onto, for example, something that the council administration has done wrong and made that the sort of the single local message focus, which really massively uh, complements the bollocks to Brexit national messaging. So that, that messaging is really important, and I've mentioned that in particular to sort of help explain, I guess as it were, why our general election campaign is likely to be similarly very focused. Obviously not just on that one issue, but predominantly it's worth always remembering if people know one thing about us, that's success. That's not failure. Um, the second thing that is really crucial to success is to have a big, is to build a big team. And if you look at, for example, two of our most spectacular council election results this year and then last year, last year in South Cambridgeshire, this year in Chelmsford, where in both cases we gained a huge number of seats to get control of the council, what those two campaigns had in common, along with many other successful campaigns elsewhere around the country, was building um, a very large team. It's a slightly wobbly floorboard, but I don't think it's going to give way. I might just step back slightly. Well, actually, I think I might just step back. It looks like there's a hole there. As well. <laughs> right. I'm going to be very nervous for the rest of this, but hopefully I won't disappear through the floor. Secret. Uh, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so the thing that they, those places have in common building a big team. And it's one of those things that's really obvious, and it sounds really only, of course, you know, surely that's the right thing to do. But it's a bit like saying you need to build a big team, it's a bit like saying, uh, I'm going to eat healthier, or I'm going to put save some money in my pension. You know, it's one of those virtuous things that's really easy to always put off. And so a lot of local parties get trapped in that cycle of not having enough people to do things, so a small number of people work themselves really busily silly, trying to do trying to do everything, and therefore they feel they never have enough time to actually go and ask other people to get involved, and therefore they there's not enough, and, they, and you get trapped in that cycle. And, you know, in a way it's brilliant that people are willing to dedicate themselves to work so hard to try and keep things going, but time and again the places where we're really successful are the ones where they break that cycle and find the time to build the bigger team and concentrate on building the team. There's a lovely story, which I'm not quite sure if it's true, but if it's not it should be true, um, about when Jeremy Brown won his seat in West Country a few general elections back and Ed Fordham was his constituency organiser, and the story is that whenever Jeremy came into the local Lib Dem office, Ed would refuse to give him any leaflets to deliver. And what he would do instead, because this was in the pre-minivan days, was give Jeremy some canvas cards for the round for which he had, a, had some leaflets in the office, and get Jeremy to go out and canvas until he found a deliverer. And then Jeremy could get the leaflets and give him to deliver, to deliver that, that round. And it's that sort of mindset, which is really easy to say, and it probably sounds a really obvious thing to do, but I know it's often quite hard to find that headroom to begin to build the bigger team. One of the great things, though, at the moment is there are... I've yet to come across a local party which doesn't have more really good leads for potential helpers that it's got time to call on. So the bottleneck, in that sense, is not how many people out there support us, or how many people out there are willing to help us, but it's us finding the time to ask those people. Which of the, you know, if you think of those three different possible problems to have, that's definitely the best of the three to have. Um, and one, the, one of the reasons, just to give you a slight sort of technical tip, one of the reasons for that is that not only obviously has our party membership grown hugely, and welcome if you are one of those who have joined, joined recently, but also across the country on average for every one member we have, we have another three people who have signed and taken part in one of the party's national campaigns, such as the Stop Brexit campaign. And where local parties have gone and spoken to those people, they're as willing, if not more willing, than members to get involved and become deliverers and put up posters and donate and come to social events and so on. So if you think about what the local party membership is and then quadruple that number... That's the pool of people out there. So there's huge potential, but building that team is really crucial. Um, the third thing, then, is the volume of activity. Um, and this is partly why building a big team is so important, is because if you go back to thinking about how little attention the public tends to pay to politics, and how little attention any one Facebook message or leaflet through the door 
and whatever bit of campaigning we can do will tend to get on its own, it requires a very high volume of activity to begin to have people pay attention to us and to notice us and to notice our messages and therefore hopefully begin to change their votes, votes as well. So if you look at whether it's Chelmsford and South Cambridgeshire in the local elections or seats that we won like Oxford West and Abingdon where Leila Moran gained the seat at the last general election, that's feel a long time ago now doesn't it just to think actually Leila Moran is still a first term MP but you know, if you look at the, those sorts of places what the level of activity was that they managed is during the election campaign as a rough rule of thumb they managed to deliver a leaflet a week and then in the last week a leaflet a day um, and that you know it takes a lot of work it takes a lot of effort and particularly in a council ward you can just about pull it off with three or four of you working yourself completely silly Unless it's you know a ward of the size, say some of those in Birmingham, but you know the ward of the size typical in in Brighton, you know three or four of you could just about put off. But then you're never really you're never really going to be able to get get out there and help win the neighbouring ward. So building that team is really crucial in order to be able to generate that volume of activity. And um, the other reason I think for mentioning that volume of activity is one of the things that the Tories did really successfully to us in the 2015 general election was spend huge amounts of money on centrally produced direct mail. So as well as what their activists were able to do on the ground, there was lots of centrally produced material going out as well. And so typically, although the Tories didn't have the people on the ground to deliver that volume of activity, in many of the seats that they say took off us in the 2015 general election, their target voters were getting you know, close enough to a letter a day from David Cameron or other Tory figures in the last few days of the election. So that's why that volume of activity is so important. And that might seem like an awful lot, um, partly because it is, but if you put that in the context of somebody also paying a bit of attention to the news during the day, and so you think about you know, how much time they might spend in total sort of paying a bit of attention to what's going on and so on, and you know, if they maybe spend five or ten minutes watching or listening to or reading a news, news bulletin or a roundup of news stories, you know, one of our leaflets is only a little chunk of that time that it takes up, so that's why we have to just keep on hammering away to begin to add up to enough attention from them to be able to change how they vote. So that level of activity is really crucial. And then the final item is this question about targeting, because it is, and I think it will be really hard for us to get this right at this election, um, but the, the basic thing about first past the post is... As the cliche goes, you know, there are no prizes for second. Well, it's not quite true, because if you finish second, you've got a better bar chart to maybe try and win the next time. But <laughs> think about, say, Leila Moran. She won her seat by less than a 1,000 votes. Would you have rather that she got a 1,000 votes less and we, in total, got a 1,000 votes more across the constituencies in Brighton that we stood last time? Or fewer votes in Brighton and just enough to get Leila over the finishing line? You think that it really makes a huge difference getting those few extra votes that means we just win a seat compared to you know, if we are going to finish say a distant third in a seat whether we're a distant third by 20,000 or by 21,000 it's not a huge deal whether we win or lose by 500 in a seat is a massive deal so that's why targeting that is concentrating our efforts in the seats that we think are most winnable is so important there's a couple of things, though, as I said, that will be really difficult about that, and I think we should just be up front and acknowledge this. It will be really difficult about that at the election. One is, quite what counts as a target seat is a little bit tricky these days, um, because our prospects have improved so much. And if you look at, for example, the seat that uh, Chuck Ramuna has decided to contest, Westminster the City of London, I think he has an excellent chance of winning that seat. Don't go and look up the election result there, though, in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to look at that, yeah. But seriously, on that basis, you think, yeah, quite rightly, there's a huge number of seats where if the other circumstances are right, we've actually got a chance of winning. Uh, so it will be difficult, and there will be, um, no doubt, controversial decisions where the local party thinks HQ's got it completely wrong and vice versa, as to which seats we think we've really got a chance of winning. But it's definitely better to target and to not quite get it right them to not target because that is sort of what went wrong for us in 2010 2010 general election uh, just a sort of quick refresher uh, we went into that election very much in third place first set of televised debates between UK wide political party leaders 
very first TV debate, luck of the draw, very first party leader to speak was Nick Clegg. Brilliant opening statement from him, a brilliant performance through the rest of the debate, and he went from largely unknown to, very briefly, more popular than Winston Churchill. <laughs> and we all got terribly excited about all the seats that we might win, and so, and so lots of people started really working on their seat, rather than going to help in a nearby target seat. And in the end, although our vote share went up, a number of seats went down. And that was partly, in large part, a self-inflicted wound, because we all got collectively so excited. And you could say, well, maybe there was a, maybe it is better to risk it and bet on, yeah, bet on a, trying to pull off a big prize of winning loads of seats than play it really safe. But, yeah, so I could definitely have sympathy with people who made that call, as it were. But we, you look at the result and you have to say, you know what, we didn't target enough. So being really enthusiastic about our chances is crucial, but we must temper that with that, remembering that targeting is really, really going to be part of it. However, there is good news in the sense that if you look at what I think mean, the smartest of local, uh, local parties have done at previous elections who aren't target seats, is there is a good way of squaring that circle. So, for example, there's a local seat in London which has not been a target seat at previous general elections and is really good at doing, building up a team of clerical helpers who have previously stuffed and addressed envelopes for other neighbouring target seats. So they've been able to build up their own organisation but actually helping us win or try to win nearby constituencies. And hurrah, because this time round there'll be a target seat, that means they've now got that clerical team and that infrastructure to be able to do all this, really help with all the sorts of stuff they've now got to do for themselves. So a really nice way of thinking about, well, you know, with things like clerical work or with things like doing telephone canvassing, you know, what can you do in a non-target seat that builds up a team that means... Everyone is in a much better position to win in the next council elections, to win in the future election when this, that local party is a target seat. But by doing that sort of activity remotely for somewhere that is a target seat this time, you get the benefits of targeting and the benefits of building up a local party so that we can carry on winning in a broader range of places in the future. And I think that would be a really useful and important thing to think about. All the more so if there are some constituencies where we end up because of negotiations and arrangements with other parties, maybe not putting up a candidate ourselves. Oh, you know, it oh. be, I won't go too much into that, because I know that's obviously quite a, a live and potentially controversial issue, but obviously looking at the picture across the country as a whole, it's likely that we will not stand a candidate in you know, every seat except for the speakers, which is normally the pattern. If only because in Bracken and Radnorshire, one of the reasons we won was because the Greens and Clyde stood down, and therefore there will be... You know, it very likely there will be some reciprocal arrangements for the May. If, if I can maybe come back to that question at the end, so I'm sure there'll be lots yeah, of questions no, on that point in particular. Yeah. Um, the, so really important to think about not just the benefits of targeting, but also the ways in which, you know, if any of us are not in a target seat, we can do activities that benefit our local party in the long run as well as helping a target seat in the short run. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a flavour of what it takes to win. Obviously, grab me afterwards to buy a copy of the book for the full book <laughs> version. But I just wanted to end on that final point, sort of recap something I said at the beginning. And with particularly Brexit being the dominant issue, it really does matter who is Prime Minister at Christmas. A massive amount of the future of our country rests on that question of who is Prime Minister, what is the makeup of the majority of MPs in Parliament. And issues like climate change are massively important for our future. But Brexit is really directly in the power of politicians to change and to decide on. And politicians, other than the House of Lords, aren't there by birthright or in perpetuity. They're there because of the result of an election. And that's what we've got the chance. We've got the fantastic opportunity to influence. So hopefully I've given you some ideas on how to do that but above all, a reminder of importance, because so much is at stake, but we can make a difference to what the outcome is. Thank you for listening. <laughs>